Uh, here to talk about the program called the Global Broadband and Innovations Alliance, and this is a core-funded program by USAID, United States Agency for International Development. And at its, at its heart, it's really to narrow the digital divide. I really appreciated Lee's uh, presentation this morning and also remarks about the digital divide. It's, it's our contention that the divide is, is growing, it's not narrowing. And the, the measure for that is, look, if you look at, you've got four billion people that are unconnected, that's, that's a problem. But uh, above and beyond that statistic, I look at it, what can you do with that? Right? And so if you have every day that I use my own children as examples, I've got two teenagers, they're digital addicts. They almost don't know how to do something if, they, if they're not doing it with a device. Right? So every day that they continue to expand their own knowledge, whether it's developing an app or doing their homework, and other kids around the world don't have access to that, that, that means that that gap is widening. Right? So it's not purely just about having access, it's about what you do with it. So our program is designed um, with four elements in mind to be able to address that. The first with the cornerstone is on the policy side. And to do that, you heard Kathy Novelli talking about national broadband strategy. So, for example, we're working with the, the Zambian government. They've pulled together about 60 key stakeholders in the country. So it's not purely the ministry that oversees telecommunications or the ICT agency, but in fact, it's the Ministry of Tourism. It's the Ministry of Education. It's also the private sector mobile network operators uh, that are all key stakeholders. Because if, unless you have the entire country that's pulling for broadband to go everywhere, you're not doing your plan right. Uh, we also work with universal service funds. Uh, so with our partner Integra, we help to work with the Nigerian government to release about $23 million. Right? So this helps to push access out to rural areas and helps to fund applications. It's worked effectively in the United States since 1936. It's working around the world and it's trying to free up those funds to allow people to be able to use it. It's also not easy. Sometimes these funds are the largest funds that countries have available to them. So the fund in Peru is roughly about $200 million and it's actually growing rather than shrinking because they can't spend it fast enough because of corruption issues. You can put out a tender there for $300,000 or less, right, With, and that could be approved in roughly one to two months. But if you put out something more, it goes, has to go through interagency committees and may never be approved in about two years. So then in fact, they've got a great fund, but it's not working really well because it's growing rather than shrinking. So they're not being able to use their funds effectively to narrow the divide, right? So these are our, our policy cornerstone. At the very heart, we work with the private sector because the private sector has to build out networks. I actually didn't know that you were going to be able to play that, that video, but we've partnered with Microsoft on that very site in Nanyuki with Mawingu Networks. It's a phenomenal project. You really should watch the video again or even look at it online. They've done an amazing job in rural Kenya because they've gotten the usage price down to about $4 a month, right? So they brought broadband internet to areas of the country that were deemed to be unprofitable by, say, Orange or Safaricom, et cetera, so the established providers. So here you have a little startup that with Microsoft backing, with USAID funds, with other funds, um, and they were able to then use new technology as well as policy reform to take advantage of what we used to call a beachfront property in the radio spectrum, as once TV spaces were, were digitized, it opened up a lot of radio, prime real estate and radio spectrum so that people could be able to use it cost effectively as they have been doing in Kenya. So we partner with the private sector to be able to bring these networks to rural areas. Uh, there's a really interesting book that just was published with USAID support with, by FHI 360 and SSG advisors. Um, it's called uh, Business Models for the Last Billion. I'd encourage every, we didn't have anything to do with it, but it, it's a great book and I would encourage people to download it if you want to read about interesting models that the private sector has been, been pushing. Um, thirdly, uh, cooperation. There's no way to get to the, the billion and a half that uh, Kathy Novelli and Manu are working on with Global Connects. Uh, without having cooperation. Our own program, we spent about $15 million. In the last five years, we've leveraged over $60 uh, million. So, uh, you know, as an example, uh, we have a project in, in Kenya, a different pro project in Kenya, where uh, we've connected the world's largest uh, refugee camp in the world. Uh, we only had to pay about one-seventh of the total cost. We had others uh, like Cisco that came to the plate, Microsoft that came to the plate and be able to say, okay, let's make this this work, and we had the established providers, those in fact the same ones that I was mentioning before in Orange and Safaricom, and now they're actually able to, to provide connectivity for all the refugees, so that the refugees can now get education online, um, and so when they go back to, say, Somalia, or where else they're from, they're able to be able to be immediately employed. 
Uh, the last thing I'd like to talk about is, is the application side of things. I mean, this is for us, it's a real driver on what people do with it. And so, you know, if you look at like a country like Lebanon, where uh, if you buy a, an internet package, it's not that you get unlimited bandwidth like you do here if you go to Comcast or Verizon, right? You're going to be limited on the number of megabytes that you're going to be able to download. So when you just look at pure access issues, yes, I might have access, but I'm not able to do things in sort of an equitable manner. I'm not able to take courses online because that's going to consume too much data, and I won't be able to pay for it. So what we strive to do is to make certain that people have affordable access, but it's also competitively provided so we have a wide variety of services. It's also fast enough to be able to do whatever you want to do um, to improve your lives, whether it's to bank. Uh, the unbanked, we've been working on programs for digital financial services to get women uh, to get their first bank accounts. It's all done through the phone. It's mobile money, if you will, like the M-Pesa program in Kenya. So we've been pushing this around the world as a way to get more people online as a draw, um, and it's a useful tool for their own lives. Um, lastly, I'd just like to leave you with a, you know, an image. About uh, 12 years ago, uh, with support from the U.S. government, we helped to make Macedonia the world's first all-wireless broadband country. And then after that, we wired every single school. So I was really encouraged to hear that Tunisia, in fact, is now after the same thing. Um, Estonia is, somebody, is a country that recently has done pretty much the same effort. If you don't, if for countries that don't adopt this, they will lose out on a competitive basis. And I, I think about uh, the Undersecretary's remark about a 10% increase in access will grow the GDP about a percent and a half. Phenomenal statistic, which should convince just about every finance minister and every education minister and every prime minister in the country, as well as every parent. I also look at it in terms of a regional comparison. And so if, say, I used Zambia before, but if Zambia is, is advancing because they're following their their national broadband plan, but Zimbabwe is not. Um, well, Zimbabwe may get the, 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 say, the percent and a half. In, in comparison terms, the Zambians move far ahead of them, right, if they've already wired and they're continuing to advance, because now kids are going to be able to take this and grow. So not only just think about that on a pure national competitive level, but since we're in a global economy, you have to put that into a global context. And I'd say that a percent and a half is not enough. That's why countries can't just increase it by 10%. They actually have to go to a full 100%, and they need to do it yesterday. So with that, thank you.